the idea that I've got these little leadership wheels that are of different sizes, but they're all connected and they're all kind of turning the entire organization. Um, I think you really sparked that when you gave me that image and it's been a, it's been a helpful coaching tool with my, my leaders. Welcome to Build Your Culture Brand with Dr. Jay Rains. As leaders, you have the ability to design and lead culture intentionally. Hear from culture leaders who are moving from a values list to values lived. Hey leaders, welcome back to the Build Your Culture Brand podcast. I have with me today my friend John Morris. He's a Chick-fil-A owner-operator at Golf Mill just in just outside of uh, Chicago there in the greater Chicago area. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. And you are coming back. Uh, one of my only two repeat guests so far, uh, you were in episode five. We were talking to you right as you were hitting your one-year mark there. Right. And so we thought it'd be fun to kind of come back and here you are. You finished year two. You're actually kind of most like a quarter into or more than a quarter into year three yeah. of your time there at Golf Mill. And uh, really thought we it'd be fun to chronicle the growth and change and just I've seen amazing things happen at your location. So, so listeners, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to episode five and hear about John's journey as you know, he's kind of early on in that journey. And there were some great takeaways that we had from that conversation, but we want to build on that and, and check in and see where John, where you are now. And so kind of a starting question uh, to get us going here and see this all from a global perspective, view how would you characterize year one versus year two and now you're in year three could you could you give us some characterizations of each of those eras we might call them yeah for sure i it's it's a funny thing because i i don't think i set out each year um with some sort of of course i set out with some strategic planning and goals i wanted to achieve and all that but i never i've never been one of these guys to set like a word for the year or a theme for the year or anything like that but in hindsight when i when i look back on it um i can definitely see some trends and, and themes to each year so in in our first year of business i really i really summarize it as we were just really focused on learning how to lead a restaurant uh, I think many first year operators will probably resonate with that. Uh, I mean, your team members are coming in and learning what color bags the chicken are in and, you know, how to work the buttons on the register. And we were just insanely focused on like, okay, let's, let's get better every day at like leading a, a restaurant, running a good restaurant. Um, going into year two, I feel like I did have a desire for this, but it certainly, it certainly ended up being sort of the theme to the year it was really focusing for myself and my leaders on learning to lead ourselves well. Um, it, you know, we, we got a decent handle on the restaurant. We had really improved month after month after month and obviously wanted to keep improving there, but the focus really shifted on, okay, how can we be great leaders? How can I be a great leader to my team and how can they and their roles focus on, uh, just being better, uh, being better every day and, and leading themselves well. So we can talk more about that through the episode, but that definitely became uh, the theme of the year. And then going into year three, we're kind of really focusing on like leading, leading the business, right? Like we're, we're keeping that desire for continual growth and improvement in ourselves, but really trying to dial in on how does that, how does that turn into business results and how are we, uh, you know, excelling and hitting our goals in the business as well. That's awesome. Well, John, I love how you characterize each of those years and frame that. Now, just looking back one year back, uh, since we've talked, since we've, or since we've had, I've, we've talked a lot since then. I've actually been at your location. I love your leaders, love your location. It's incredible to see all the the language and languages and cultures that have descended upon your your team. It's amazing the team that you've built there. Looking back though on last year, uh, what have been some behavior changes that you felt like have had the biggest impact on your team on your organization? For for me personally, um, it's it's been a commitment to 
my daily personal disciplines, particularly with, with leadership growth, um, starting each day with getting something in my system that I'm learning, um, that is, is helping me be a better leader. And as, as sort of a mechanism to hold myself accountable to that, when I, when I committed to doing that, uh, I told my entire team, we have kind of an online platform app that we use and I told them, said, hey, I've had this reignited passion to um, just do daily development for myself. And to make sure I do that, I'm going to commit to you all. I'm going to share my learnings with you guys every single day. So um, my team every morning between, <laughs> if, if it's an early morning for me, they might get it at 6.30 a.m. To, to 9 a.m. somewhere in there. They get um, a, a little piece of wisdom from me. Uh, it's either... It's a screenshot from a book. Um, it's an audio clip of a podcast I've listened to. It's um, I keep a note in my phone of just some great uh, wisdom I get from different sources. I've even used Instagram clips and YouTube clips that I come across, um, and I really enjoy that. And I think I think the way it's impacted my business is it it's just made me a better leader. Um, I feel like I have a tool belt in, in, at any given time of when I'm coaching a leader, or trying to provide encouragement or feedback. Um, sometimes those things are more powerful when they're not your own words. So, so I say, Hey, I, you know, I heard this great thing from a legendary football coach, or, I, uh, you know, I, I listened to this thing the other day from John Maxwell, I wanted to share with you. And I think it holds more value and credibility in their eyes, maybe. Um, but I, I've, I've just found so many moments this year where I've digested something in the past week or two that I realize I'm like, man, that was for that leader. Like I, I needed to hear that to help myself, but it, it's also, I think it was meant for them. And so that's been huge. Um, and I would say in the business, just a practical behavior change we've made that had immediate effects and still is just a tremendous value add for us is um, committing to doing daily huddles, uh, pre-shift huddles. Um, and I huddles are not new in the restaurant world. I, I had heard about them for a long time. And I think I sort of, I think I sort of wrote them off uh, trying to apply it in my business. Cause I just, you know, I would think like, well, we're not the Ritz Carlton. We don't have this big shift change where we're like, we can do a huddle and you know, we're a, we're a living, breathing, busy restaurant. But I was at, I was at Chick-fil-A's regional planning meetings and we just started this in October. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about six months ago, we've started this. Um, but I was at regional planning meetings in October and during a presentation, I saw somebody share a video of a restaurant doing a huddle like I hadn't seen before because I would describe it as a, and I think it was actually, um, I, I'll give, I think it was Nick Westbrook's restaurant in Georgia okay. was yeah. where this video was from. Shout out to Nick. Um, so shout out to Nick. Uh, he, he shares so much. And I think a lot of operators get some great wisdom and tools from him. But yeah, they shared this video of a working huddle happening in his restaurant. And the team was doing their job. But there was just this really energetic, you know, shift leader, team leader doing kind of an all call like, hey, guys, listen up. We're going to do our, our huddle you know, he's emphasizing some main points. He's asking the team questions like, hey, what's what's a way you can give great second mile service today, Tatiana? And the, the team members are interacting. So anyway, I think that I think that gave me a realistic picture of what that could look like. And um, we instituted it. We instituted it with our team. And whenever we start a new habit or, or process, we we have to have some measure of accountability for it. So Still right now, because it's a relatively newer habit, our team is having to post a picture of their huddle. You know, kitchen and front have to post their pre-lunch huddle picture. Dinner has to post theirs in our in our leadership chat. And man, it's just had tremendous impacts on on some of our business results right away. So that's been that's a huge one. That's so good. I remember when you were talking about starting that and, and I was excited for you because I knew I knew I'd seen the impact from that before, but I also knew that's hard to maintain because yeah, I think that the normal image of a huddle is you circle up, you know, you kind of, you, you pull together and you actually stop working. But that idea of a, of a working huddle is so incredible. So yeah. Well, thank you, don't Nick, get, for don't that get me vision. Wrong. <laughs> don't get me wrong with some of our, some of our Chicago sales patterns. There are plenty of opportunities where we do have a circle up. There's no cars in the drive through. Okay. We do it. But, um, yeah, it, it's been awesome for us, and we definitely 
uh, plan to continue that that pattern. Well, okay. So let's say someone hears this and they think, "Wow, I, I'd like to try a huddle." What what would you characterize like? What happens in the huddle? What are some things that really have to happen in a huddle to make a huddle successful? Yeah, I think I think number one, it just needs to have it needs to have some sort of um, enthusiasm and energy to it. I, I don't, I don't want it to be an empty pep rally. Um, but I also don't want it to be this, Hey guys, here's a couple things we need to go over today sort of thing. So, um, you know, I've charged my leaders with bringing some energy to it. Um, I think there, there are a couple sections. We actually have an outline that we, we update each week for our huddle. And, um, you know, one of the sections is just sort of a rotating, a rotating um, piece of our, our core values. So, you know, we have like a core value for the week that they're focusing on and um, that's part of it. Then there's a, there's a rotational content for different business goals and focuses. Um, so one, one of them that we have right now is heavily promoting mobile drive through um, and expecting our order takers to always begin the transaction with the question Hi there. Have you placed a mobile mobile drive through order today? Just to get it in the brains of our customers. So they're hitting that every single day. Um, once we have a different focus, you know, we'll rotate something else in there. Um, there, then there's there's one where they're recalibrating and and resetting expectations on some of our goals. You know, we're talking about window time goals, um, speed of service goals. Um, procedural reminders, things like that. And then we always end with our mission of sort of doing a chant uh, as well. So I, I think it's good to have some structure to it and have, you know, on whatever cadence makes sense for your business, but just rotate that content so it stays fresh for the team as well. I love it. And I love that you're providing the framework and then, and even some of the talking points so that they have a script, they know how to follow and know how to win. So also looking back last year, how have you seen your top leaders grow? Where have you seen growth with them? Yeah, well, I, I mean, one of the biggest ways and, and I think the most exciting way I've seen them grow is in the growth of our leadership team as a whole. Um, I, I was updating our org chart the other day and some things and I'm like, holy cow, to be in our third year and we've got a total leadership group of, I think, I think we're at 19 people that are on our leadership team, range, ranging from, you know, team leaders, managers, directors, senior director. Um, and so that's really exciting. And, you know, we've got, we've got business metrics ultimately that are going to show like, are, are we being successful in, you know, uh, our leadership? But I've, I've told my top, top leaders a lot, my top directors, I said, for me, the ultimate sign that you're being successful in your role is that you're developing you're developing people underneath you that are achieving great results. Um, and I, my my top director in the restaurant, I've told him many times, I, like I'm I'm fully confident that you are good and that you can do this job. But the ultimate sign of success for you is not that you can do it; it's that others can do it. And so, um, you know, both of my directors this year have done a really good job in year two of um, giving responsibility to others, um, having good cadences of follow up, teaching, coaching, encouraging, um, where they, they've really developed some phenomenal managers underneath them, some phenomenal team leaders. Um, and, you know, you you gave me something really good on a coaching call Um recently that I've, I've started using with them of this analogy of um, like the spokes of a wheel. And so the way I've described it to my directors is I think in year one and part of year two, it was like, if you imagine a wheel, like my director was the center, they were the middle, the middle of the wheel and all the spokes, you know, went to them. So they were fielding every request, every challenge, you know, dealing with all of it. And what I really charge them with this year is develop your right hand people that that level just underneath you that can create another center to another wheel. So some of those spokes that have all been pointing to you are now um, helping to be carried by a strong leader that that, you know, your main leadership focus and energy is going to them so that they're, you know, leading and focusing on these others. Um, and so 
we've they've really started doing that well and i think we'll continue to just kind of build that that out you know which is a cool it's a cool metaphor if you think about it because when i when i imagine just adding more wheels you know to this whole thing it kind of creates like a mechanism you know that that turns the whole things i'm super into watches and so i geek out about that but the idea that I've got these little leadership wheels that are of different sizes, but they're all connected and they're all kind of turning the entire organization. Um, I think you really sparked that when you gave me that image and it's been a, it's been a helpful coaching tool with my, my leaders. So. That's so awesome. Amazing. Yeah. I love it. I, I have watched your leaders really, they've leveled up, you know, they've had to, the business has grown in, in this last year. Um, and they, they seem to have taken some of the weight off of your shoulders and really taken responsibility and ownership has, has moved and shifted their direction more. But I love this idea that now ownership is shifting down to this third and or fourth level that they're really taking on those, the, yeah, they're the wheel, they're the, the center of that wheel and it revolves around them. So John, I know uh, you and I've talked a lot about culture. I mean, this is a culture brand podcast. Uh, culture is a big topic of, of yours and mine. And what are some things that m help make your culture at your organization unique? Yeah, I think, I think first of all, um, kind of getting a baseline on what culture is. Um, I, I don't have a written out, you know, clear definition of it, but the way I like to describe it to people is I think, I think ultimately culture is, is, um, it, it's a, it's a feeling, it's a vibe, it's an energy. It's this, like, it's this thing you can't pin down to the ground. It's, it's an aura that, you know, um, comes to be. And I think it's, I think it's really the collection of what, what people believe, what people commit to, uh, and the behaviors of a, of a place. Um, you think about the culture that Spain has versus the culture of what, you know, America has. And it's, it's, it's a collection of those things. So um, I think, I think what makes ours unique is, um, you know, I, I put a lot of work as we were getting ready to open and some of the, some of the markers for direction in the organization, you know, wanting to have a mission that my team was clear on and some core values and things like that. Um, and then in year two, it was really a process for me. Like, I think I had described to you on some coaching calls. It was like, I feel like I have a bunch of documents. <laughs> it's like, here's our restaurant mission. Then I've got a document that's got our core values. And, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure they, they know the strategy for the restaurant too, and all these things. And, um, I, I went through a process of kind of putting them together this year into what I, I call our credo. So, you know, a credo is is a collection of beliefs that drive our behavior. And at the end of the day, I think that's what all these things are. It's um, it's it's our mission, it's our core values, it's our strategy, culture, brand. Um, and I I really believe though culture can be sticky and gray and hard to pin down. You can really craft the culture that you want by creating a a recipe of sorts, right? And um, baking those things in. And so for us, that's that's what our credo is. Um, and, you know, a, a change I made this year, I, I'll share this with you because you you kind of challenged me to do it is, um, you know, getting, getting a credo card put together. So this is something in my restaurant that it's wallet sized. Um, you know, a lot of my team puts it in the back of their phone case or their, their actual wallet or whatever. But it has our mission. Um, it has our strategy along with the, the core four, because that's important. It has our core values. And then this is really more for leadership and we reference it a lot, but because I want to be a place where people can aspire to do more, I, I share it with the team too, like our culture brand. How do we, how do we really define what's important in our leadership? Um, and this has been, a, this has been a game changer for us. My team has to, um, it's part of their uniform, like their name tag. Um, and so the way we do that is this is their ticket to get their break meal. So when they go around and order at the register, um, you know, they're asked, do you have your credo card with you? They have to pull it out and show it. Um, 
And if they don't, if they don't have it, it's not that they can't eat. It's just the disincentive we provide for not carrying it is you have to pay one dollar to get a new credo card. Um, so some of them have have had to do that, you know, a time or two, but they they quickly are like, I'm not gonna pay a dollar every time you get my break meal. But it, it's been important for us to just say, hey, this is the foundation of our business and what we do comes from who we are. So this is defining who we are. And ultimately, I think that translates into better performance and better business results. So, well, I like how you know, of course, building in those rhythms for your team. You've worked hard to build rhythms for yourself, but you're building rhythms for your team. Uh, you know, you, you're describing. I, I had, I had my strategy on all these documents. I've, now I've got it on like a business card size where. And by the way, that's in multiple languages, right? That's also in Spanish. Yeah, I have a Spanish version as well. Okay. And then, and they're able to show that and they talk about it. Um, so you're, you're able to really simplify that and make it very tangible, but you're also adding value, you know, like showing the value of it by attaching it even to their break disc, their meal discount and, uh, you know, in a small way showing, Hey, this is a valuable part of who we are. And, uh, there's more value here even than a dollar, but indicating that value is built in. So great job. Right. Well, and, and I'll tell you, I, I can't remember. I think it did happen early on last year. Um, you know, I'll I'll share this. I, I ended up letting a leader go um, over this because this particular leader thought that it wasn't fair that the team had to show this credo card in order to get their break meal. And you know, the discussions we had about it were really, okay, you're, you're putting your opinion and preference over what, what I, as the business owner, am saying, this is vitally, vitally important to us. Um, and he, he really just would not yield. We tried to have a conversation about, um, you know, what that looked like. And so it's, it's that important to me. It's, it's not just like, oh, it's this, it's this stupid little thing where they have to, you know, show it to get their break meal. I, I, I'm really putting a stake in the ground to say, Hey, this is the foundation of our business and a team member having it on them at all times is just emphasizing that importance. Um, so it's, yeah, it's critical for our business. Yeah. How do you turn culture from muddy to measurable? Yeah, I think, I think the first part is defining the, the pieces of your culture. And, and for us, that's, you know, the different elements on, our, our credo card. So it, it comes from definition. Um, I think the way that translates into, to, to actual results in the business, um, it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like working backwards, right? So, um, even with who we bring on our team, uh, you know, our interview questions are all based from our core values. So, you know, one of our one of our core values is ownership. And so when we're sitting across the table from a new candidate, a very strategic question we ask is, hey, tell us about a time, you know, on a previous job or maybe a school or, or wherever where you made a mistake. What was it and what did you do afterward? And what we're looking for in their response is a demonstration of ownership, of, of taking responsibility. Um, and so it starts there. I'm trying to get people on our team that demonstrate at least most of these core values that we have. Um, I, I think it also it also turns into, uh, you know, it, it finds its way into our assessments of team members and leaders. So, you know, the assessment tools that we use are based on things that are on that credo card. Um, we're sort of like it's sort of like in school where the you have those great teachers who when you would do a review for the test, they're like, all right, I'm giving you the questions that are going to be on the test so that you can, you can learn them. And so um, I think that's how we make it tangible and, and real in our restaurant is um, we're finding, we're finding really valuable uses for the pieces of our credo throughout the business from, from recruiting and hiring to assessment, to coaching and training. Um, it's, we're trying to bake it through the organization in all those ways. John, I love, I love your team. I love how diverse it is and how, I mean, your leaders are just, they're full of joy when I'm with them. I mean, they're just so joyful and 
they they're so loyal to you. You you invest in them personally as well as through the business, and it really shows. Um, so I hope your impact continues to grow your influence through the business. And I, one final question, you know, for our listeners today would be what, you know, you're, you're working through year three here. What might you offer as that piece of wisdom or advice to someone who's kind of in, in year one or year two, if you could cast that backwards to them, what would you offer them? It sounds a little It sounds a little trite or cliche, but I would say, especially in year one, like year, year one is going to, going to be rough no matter what. Like, I don't care if you're the, (laughs) you're the best, you're the best, you know, operator candidate that's ever come through selection. Like nobody is exempt or immune from just the hard of that first year of business. And and you shouldn't be, I, I think, I think that's what, that's what you learn from and grow from. And so I would say if there's anybody listening, who's just really in the thick of it and struggling, um, just recognize like God has you exactly where you need to be for his purposes and for your good as well, even though it doesn't feel very loving, um, you know, to be, to be going through some different struggles. I would say that, um, I would say number two, I I wish that I had trusted my gut a little bit more early on. There were some there were some people things and especially, you know, we talked a lot about culture. There were some pretty clear cultural things that I felt in my gut where somebody wasn't they wasn't they weren't a fit. Um they were at times like actively working against what we were trying to do from a culture standpoint. And I wish I had I wish I had made some quicker and more decisive uh, calls with those people early on to, you know, jettison them from the organization. Um, and then the the third thing is, I I think from this interview today, like I I'm really reflecting and seeing how much stuff I've I've borrowed from other great leaders and and other Chick Fil A restaurants and other organizations and you know, even, even the, the credo cards and the huddles and things like that, these are, these are things that I've known about for years. And I think, I think I didn't implement them, not out of a sense of like, oh, those don't, those don't work or anything like that. I just, I I didn't know how to make them practical for myself and for my business. And so I would really, I would really encourage people as you pick up things from other operators and you, you chew on ideas to implement in the business, you truly just have, you do have to make it your own and say, okay, I think there can be value in that, but um, it doesn't have to look like everybody else's way of doing that. How does it fit me, my style, my team? Um, because we, we've seen, I think we've seen really a lot of value coming from some of these these habits and tools and resources, you know, baking them into the business. So John, you've really gained some traction. I mean, just ongoing more and more traction every year, every month, and it just creates that momentum. It's not, you know, it, it, there's not always these overnight big changes. It's right. that ongoing continual growth. And I love that. I love that drive from you. Also love just kind of to our listeners, like John's really done great work on, on, comparing against himself rather than others. And I love that. I think that's a great example for operators. So John, congratulations to you as you work through year three, we'll have to do this every year and kind of circle back and and chronicle (laughs) this progress. Um, Look forward to talking to you soon and having you back on the show. Thanks so much for your time today and sharing your journey with our listeners. Yeah, my pleasure, Jay. Thanks for the invitation to do it. Thank you for listening to Build Your Culture Brand with Dr. Jay Raines. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Visit our website at buildyourculturebrand.com for our free culture brand assessment. See you next time. We would like to note that Leaders Q serves individual owner operators and their teams and is not affiliated, endorsed by, or in any way officially connected with Chick-fil-A Incorporated.